Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Jeff Finn, CEO of Realnex, and welcome to our webinar series. Today, we'll be focusing on Introduction to Investment Analysis with Dr. Jeff Fisher. Uh, as I've uh, communicated and you've seen in the, the promotion, uh, Dr. Fisher literally wrote the book on property finance and investments. He's head of data and research for Realnex and formerly uh, professor at Professor of Real Estate at Indiana University Kelly School of Business, and he's the co-author of Real Estate Finance and Investments and Income Property Valuation. In addition to his text and teaching at IU, he has developed a, or taught courses on investment analysis for the Appraisal Institute, the CCIM Institute, the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries, among many others. As part of the session today, Dr. Fisher will leverage the Realnext Market Edge Solution, which is used to model investments in his textbook and is available to uh, many of you who are using it, as well as to uh, all of the designees of the, the CCIM Institute have access to the Market Edge Solution for Financial Investment Analysis. Uh, Realnext is delighted to bring you this webinar as part of our ongoing educational series, and thank you once again for joining. See, many of you are existing clients, but some of you are, are new to Realnex, and we're pleased to support you and the industry with our, uh, our educational series, as well as our holistic suite of solutions that we've built for the real estate industry, which in addition to the investment and comparative lease analysis in Market Edge is a holistic tool with integrated uh, platforms to uh, enable the industry to, to better manage their their CRM and their, their asset information, a truly CRE-centric CRM platform that we've built with an integrated transaction management uh, function for tenant rep and leasing, as well as a presentation creation. Uh, we are really proud of the not just the investment analysis tool, but within our marketed solution, you can also create beautiful flyers, brochures, comprehensive proposals, broker opinions of value, offering memorandums, and we have integrated deal rooms to streamline the investment sales process. So not only can we help you with the numbers, but we can help you execute and run the process to uh, make the trade in, in the marketplace. We also have a dynamic uh, uh, public listing system to expose your properties, as well as a privately hosted private label system to plug into your website and an email e-marketing campaign manager to drive traffic and generate leads. And on top of all of that, we're really uh, proud of the new virtual reality that we've got for commercial uh, property, whether leasing existing space or to be built space, using VR to showcase your property is unlike any other tool that we found to, to better envision what a property could be and how it can work for you and your, your clients. So once again, we're delighted to have you with us, delighted to have Dr. Fisher share his uh, expertise on investment analysis. Let me turn the, the presentation over to, to Jeff and we will get started. Excellent. So thanks, Jeff. We are okay. Thank you, Jeff. Go. And you should see my screen now. I'll go into full screen yeah. mode. Hopefully everything is working fine. I had to switch to my laptop at the last minute here. For some reason, my uh, desktop didn't like uh, going to the webinar. And so this will be a crash course on real estate investment analysis. And we'll show how you can uh, get the same answer as, as uh, I have in my textbook with real estate, uh, with Ronex Market Edge. Um, as a disclaimer, Jeff already mentioned I'm involved with Realnex, also an investor in, in Realnex. And I'm going to show an example today that does come from my textbook. So um, it'll be uh, the same example that's uh, a, a uh, office building that's uh, in my textbook. There's several examples that are in the textbook, one apartments and, and one office and some other property types. and I'm going to use the office example in the webinar. All right, so basic idea of discounted cash flow analysis um, from uh, the movie Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Um, that may seem a little bit silly, but um, a lot of the errors that I've seen people make uh, when they're doing uh, investment analysis and especially discounted cash flow analysis is they, they forget that 
what really matters is the cash flows. That's why it's called discounted cash flow analysis. It's all about the actual cash flows. It's, it's not accrual accounting. Uh, what we care about is how much money we're actually going to receive and when we're going to receive that money. So the focus of this webinar is going to be to first review the concepts behind a lease by lease discounted cash flow analysis where we can consider the actual leases on the property. Um, the concepts are really the same for all the lease by lease programs that I've seen, uh, whether it's our real next market edge, whether it's Argus, uh, BCF or, or enterprise, or, or even if you do it in a, in a spreadsheet, it's really the same concepts. It applies to both investment analysis and valuation appraisal because um, really they're, they're kind of the same thing. Investment analysis calculates a rate of return and, and other measures that we'll talk about, but a rate of return, which could be before or after tax, given the price you want to pay for the property. The appraiser uh, turns that around. They say, okay, what should you pay for the property or what purchase price, what should the purchase price be given that there's some rate of return that a typical investor is going to want in the market? That would give you a market value. Um, or if you want to think about it as an investment value to a particular investor, it'd be what rate of return do you need, which could be on an after-tax basis. What, what do you need as an investor and therefore what price are you willing to pay? Pretty much the same mathematics. So we're going to talk about uh, an example using an office building, as I mentioned. Um, you can, after the webinar, if you want, um, you can open the example using the real estate exchange in Market Edge. Uh, it's going to be the same example as I've mentioned in my textbook. So let's talk about basic ingredients to any discounted cash flow analysis. First thing we need to do is think about the holding period. Uh, what you typically see is a 10-year holding period. Uh, it doesn't have to be a 10-year holding period, but that's sort of typical that you see in a discounted cash flow analysis. Um, although actually the average holding period that, that we see for investors at least for the institutional investors that I track is, is more like five years right now. Um, but we usually try to capture the, the leases and any lease roll, rollovers that might occur over a period that um, goes closer to 10 years. And in theory, it really shouldn't matter because your resale price is trying to capture the present value of all future income after the, the resale. Uh, what you're really trying to do is, is just make sure you're, you're capturing any existing leases that, that might be rolling over um, and it's easier to estimate a resale price at the end of that holding period if if our income is is at market rents that we apply a cap rate to. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about applying a cap rate to, uh, to the income as we move along. Then we want to project our income from existing leases. Um, so you're going to have some current rent on the property, um, which could be uh, stepping up over time. Um, could look at that on a per square foot basis or a per unit basis for apartments, other ways we could do it. Um, don't see that much of this uh, in recent years, but there could be CPI adjustments in, in the lease. Um, used to be we'd have leases where um, rents would increase by 50% of any increase in the CPI. You could also have some other sources of income like percentage rents, retail space. Um, and you could have reimbursements, which is going to be important. We'll talk about how that works, you know, like pass throughs of any expenses above a, a certain stop. So that'll be part of the, the income that we need to project from the existing leases. So we've selected a holding period. Uh, we're thinking about what our income is going to be for existing leases. Um, then as we continue, is there any other income? Vending, laundry, telecommunications, parking, we, we want to add that in. You know, one of the questions would be, is, is that subject to vacancy or not? We'll have to decide. Um, and then what happens when those leases renew? Um, are there any renewal options in the existing leases? What will market rents be at the time of the lease renewal? Um, and uh, sometimes uh, we think of that in terms of, you know, what's the rent for a new tenant? Uh, what's a rent, the rent if we keep our existing tenant, which, which may be lower, may be willing to accept a lower rent if it's an existing tenant because we're not going to have to, maybe spend as much money on TIs and, and leasing commissions. And then, you know, what's the probability that that tenant's going to renew and programs uh, that, that have you put in renewal probabilities really just take a, a weighting of, of the, uh, the rent for a new tenant versus the rent if, if the existing tenant renews. It's just a, like 75% of the $15. Um, well, actually, uh, if they renewed, it'd be 14, so 75% 
renewal probability would mean at 75% chance you're going to get $14 and a 25% chance you're going to get $15. And, you know, therefore, uh, the program is really just going to use $14 and 25 cents. Will there be additional TIs when the lease rollovers, which could also be different for new versus renewal tenants? Um, will there be leasing commissions when the lease rolls, which could differ for new and renewal tenants? And will there be some vacancy because it's going to take time to, to get a new tenant? So all these things would usually be inputs that you can put into the program when you're doing this type of lease by lease analysis. Continuing with our basic uh, ingredients, is there any space currently that's vacant? Um, and if there is, how fast will that be absorbed and, and at what rate? So there'd be inputs for that. Um, then turning to our operating expenses, um, you know, what are the expenses that the owner has to pay, even if they are reimbursable? You know, so we want to capture all the expenses that, that the owner would have to pay, even though we may turn around and get some of those back through uh, a net lease or um, if it's a reimbursable expense. So property taxes, insurance, maintenance, marketing, et cetera. Um, sometimes uh, we specify whether those are fixed, variable, or some percentage of them is, is fixed is another way to think about it. You know, and, and by variable, we mean it varies with occupancy. Fixed, it does not vary with, with occupancy. All expenses would tend to, you know, to change over time. Um, so what, what we mean by fixed versus variable here is, is whether it varies with occupancy. And then do we have any capital expenditures? Sometimes we, we think of that as below the line items, you know, so deferred maintenance. Uh, so you're buying a property and there's some, some deferred maintenance that has to be taken care of right away or some other renovations when you purchase the property. Are there some anticipated capital expenditures during the holding period? You know, so we know we're gonna have to replace the, the roof or the HVAC three years from now. Um, that, that could be put in as a cash flow that's gonna occur in, in year three or whatever you're, whenever you're projecting that's going to happen. Alternatively, uh, most programs will allow you to put that, uh, those kinds of things in as a, as a reserve allowance uh, or reserve account. So you would be deducting an amount each year for future replacements. Uh, that's kind of a fuzzy area in, in practice. It's, you know, it's kind of a violation of what I said before that, you know, we should be looking at actual cash flows. Uh, my preference would, would be to put in uh, any capital expenditures when you think they're actually going to occur. And in fact, you, you want to, if you're looking at it on an after-tax basis, you want to start depreciating those items when, when they're expected to occur. Um, I think the idea of using a, a reserve account was more when we, we wanted to um, get a more real, realistic cap rate on a property and, and we know that there's going to be some lumpy expenses. And so we want to smooth that out in, in a net operating income that we used to get a cap rate. Jeff, if any if any questions pop in, uh, let me know as we're as we're going through this. Hopefully, I'm not not going too fast. Loan information. So this is optional. Uh, there could be more than one loan on the property. Um, so if you want to take into consideration the loan and and how that would impact your rate of return, the leverage, which hopefully would be positive, um, leverage could could be positive or could be negative. Um, in in general, the idea is you you want to get a rate of return on the property that's that's more than you're paying on the loan. Um, so we'd specify the amount of the loan, either as a loan to value ratio, or sometimes uh, it, you specify a maximum debt service coverage ratio, or, um, I should say a minimum debt service coverage ratio that, that the lender would want. And, and that uh, turn, determines your loan payments that you can make, which in, in turn determines the amount of loan that you can get on the property. And then the amortization period, whether you're going to have any balloon payment, which would be uh, where the, you know, it might be that the loan is amortized over 25 years, but there's a balloon payment a after 10 years. Um, so the balance would have, have to be paid off after 10 years, uh, but you're not going to amortize it over 10 years. You're going to amortize it over some longer time period. And then, of course, the, the interest rate on the loan. Uh, again, this would only be relevant if you want to look at things on a, uh, a levered basis. Sometimes you want to look at it both ways. What, what's the rate, rate of return if you don't borrow any money? Uh, make sure the underlying economics make sense. And then, you know, what, what kind of return are you getting, taking into consideration the loan? And is that resulting in favorable leverage or not? 
Discount rates. You wouldn't necessarily have to have a discount rate if you're just interested in what rate of return you're going to get, um, but you may also want to calculate something like a net present value or, or even figure out uh, what price you're willing to pay for the property. Again, the idea of coming up with an investment value or a market value. And so you need a discount rate for that because that's that's the rate of return that you want. So uh, you, the program is going to figure out the price you you would pay to get that rate of return. Um, that could be looked at on on either an unleveraged basis if you don't have any financing or, or what would it be taking into consideration that you're going to have a loan on the property. Normally those would be different rates um, because if there's a, a loan, hopefully you expect to get a, a higher rate of return on your equity investment. Tax information, also optional, um, but if, if you're coming at this more from an investor perspective, you want to get an idea uh, what kind of tax benefits you're getting and, and what your after-tax rate of return is. There's still some favorable tax benefits associated with, with investing in, in real estate, because mainly because of the depreciation, um, because you can depreciate the property over a shorter time period than it actually wears out in, in economic terms, like still 27 and a half years for for apartments. Um, so um, you would enter in the uh, depreciation rate, which would depend on whether it's commercial or residential property, uh, an ordinary income tax rate that you expect to pay, capital gains tax rate, um, and the program uh, would take into consideration that there's depreciation recapture at the rate of 25%. In other words, any any depreciation you took that was saving you money at ordinary income tax rates does come back to you when you resell the property at a 25% tax rate. Um, so the idea here is is not to replicate what you know might be done in, in a turbo tax um, that captures all the, all the nitty gritty details of taxation, but you're trying to get an idea you know, what, what might my after-tax rate of return be compared to my before-tax rate of return? You know, for example, you might have somebody that's in a 30% ordinary income tax bracket. Um, the program says, well, your before-tax IRR is 12%. Your after-tax IRR is 10%. So your effective tax rate is just 20%. In other words, your IRR only dropped by 20% when it went from 12% down to 10%. Um, so... You do have some tax benefits, again, because of the, the uh, depreciation, which is sheltering ordinary income, even though it comes back later on when you sell the property at, at uh, uh, some of it anyway, comes back at, at that 25% rate, uh, but the rest of, the, of it would be taxed at a capital gains tax rate. And so you've deferred taxes um, and uh, you've converted some of, some of that from ordinary income to capital gains um, and your interest is, is all tax deductible. So. Uh, that's that's also gonna gonna help your effective tax rate when you bring leverage in into the situation. It actually tends to lower your your effective tax rate even more. Last but not least, um, what's our estimated resale price at the end of the holding period? Um, and then things to think of there is well, is is there a right of first refusal by the uh, by one of the tenants? especially if, if it's a single tenant property um, to, to buy the property. Um, if not, what we usually think of is what will be the net operating income one year after sale of the property. So if it's 10 year holding period, what we're actually gonna do is, is estimate what the NOI would be in year 11, because that's the first year NOI to the buyer. The idea is, well, what would a buyer pay for the property if we sell it at the end of 10 years, where a buyer is looking at year 11 as as the buyer's first year of owning the property? And then what we generally do is try to simplify the way we we estimate that resale price by, by applying a cap rate to that net operating income uh, one year after the, the projected year of sale. Um, so it's just a matter of dividing the income in, say, year 11, if it's a 10 year holding period, buy some cap rate. Um, we call that a terminal cap rate. Um, how do we think about the terminal cap rate? Well, we usually start with what cap rates are today for properties. I'm sure, you know, most if not all of you are certainly familiar with what we mean by a cap rate, just a simple ratio of net operating income to value. Um, but cap rates may be projected to increase a little bit in the future, especially if interest rates are gonna be going up as we, might be happening um, 
especially by the time we get out 10 years from now, since we have historic low rates now. So we might think, well, if interest rates are going to be higher, that could push up cap rates, although um, actually inflation would tend to offset that because uh, a cap rate also takes into consideration what kind of growth you're going to get on the property in the future. The more properties are expected to grow, the, the lower the cap rate because you're willing to, to buy a property at, at a higher percentage of current net operating income. So that would also enter into it. And all else being equal, even if we don't think cap rates are going to change, um, we usually think, well, we're, we are trying to project out what the income is going to be 10 years from now, and our crystal ball isn't that clear. So we're going to put a little bit of a risk premium on that cap rate. Um, and since the property is older, uh, it's all else being equal, it's going to have a little bit less growth, and less growth uh, means a higher cap rate. Same same ideas I talked about before, where um, more growth would would tend to lead to a lower cap rate. So, what we're trying to do is estimate what a cap rate would be uh, out 10 years from now, maybe a little bit above what cap rates are today. Divide that into our projected income one year after we think we're going to sell the property. So that covers all the basic agreement ingredients that go into a a discounted cash flow analysis. I wanted to provide that perspective when we then turn to um, looking at how you would do this in uh, in real next in, in market edge. Market edge is just one of the many tools uh, that are available in in the real next suite. Um, I won't try to talk about all of them today. We have other webinars that, that talk about the other tools, the CRM and and uh, the listing platform and um, Lots of other ways that, that we can use the real next suite, in, including the, the virtual reality um, and including v, the uh, 3D models and, and listings. So what we're, we're going to look at is the investment tools. I have the arrow there pointed to the investment tools. Um, and that's going to take us to um, the investment tools where, where you have a list of the different properties that you may have analyzed in the past. What I'm going to do is, is use one of the textbook examples, which is called Monument Office, um, just, just a made-up example. Um, not, not really the true address there, but if you put in an address, then you'll get a nice picture uh, of, of the property um, because the, you know, the address uh, will allow you to use Google Maps um, in order to, to uh, know the exact location of the property on, on a map and, and uh, any pictures that might be available or, or pictures that you might already have uh, that you've saved for the property. So then we're going to go to the first input screen. Uh, so some basic information on the property. You don't necessarily need all this information to do your analysis like the address. You, you do want to have a, an analysis date because that's going to be the date at which you're, you're getting the value. Um, we're going to pay $8,500,000 for this property. I, I put the, uh, uh, the box around some of the, the more important inputs. So obviously you need a purchase price if you want to do an investment analysis and see what the rate of return would be before or after tax. The rentable square foot is going to be important because we're actually going to look at the individual leases, but we want to make sure that we've accounted for, for those 96,000 square feet of, of rentable area. Um, we're going to have uh, actually there's there's going to be three tenants in 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 this the three should have covered up the six there um, this there's going to be three tenants in in this analysis um, the ownership um, it's not really going to affect our analysis but we can indicate there if if it's a fee simple ownership or uh, actually <laughs> sort of a uh, a joke there, not not so simple anymore. I say that because there's a big debate right now, especially uh, within the Appraisal Institute, as as to uh, uh, what the real meaning of, of fee simple is and versus leased fee. Uh, I always learned that if a property is subject to leases, it's no longer fee simple; it's a leased fee. But evidently, um, that's not in Black's Law Dictionary, and and uh, so sometimes. You know, even if it's a property subject to leases, the argument is it's really still fee simple. And uh, but anyway, in any case, that doesn't really affect the uh, the analysis. Um, although, um, if we if we're truly trying to get uh, what I always thought of as a fee simple value is 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 not a, encumbered by current leases, uh, or or said differently, that assumes all leases are at current market rents, which is what you need to do for property tax purposes. 
um, you can certainly do that in market edge you would just make sure that all your assumptions about the leases are starting off at market rents and and they're not above market or below market so we can certainly calculate a value uh, whether it, it's the way we think of fee simple is uh, all leases are at market rents or or on a leased fee basis where the existing leases could be above or below market. Okay, enough on that. If we get down to the bottom though, the resale information, um, we have a land value in there. Um, we've already specified a purchase price, but for tax purposes, we can only depreciate the building. So that's why there's a, a land input. Um, it's not really resale information. It's just gonna impact our, our analysis. Um, uh, especially on an after-tax basis. Before tax, it won't matter, but after tax, it will. Um, you'll notice for the uh, selection of how we're going to estimate the resale price, it says capitalization of NOI. This is what you see you know, probably 90% of the time. There'd be other options, like you know the resale price in dollars, or uh, you want to apply a growth rate to the purchase price. But what, what you normally see is capitalization of NOI at some cap rate. Here it's 10.6%. Um, and then you notice the checkbox subsequent year, which is what you're going to normally do uh, because that's in theory the way we're supposed to be and in what's used in practice, uh, the way we want to think about a, a terminal cap rate for the reasons I said earlier, uh, we're applying that to the net operating income uh, one year after sale. That's why it says subsequent year because that's the first year of NOI to the buyer. Um, there may also be some resale expenses. I don't have any in this example, but you know, normally you'd, you'd have some commissions and other expenses associated with resale of the property. And then the discount rate would, would be what rate of return we would like to get on the property. A little, little high by uh, for today's market, but uh, that's what we have in this particular example. You're looking for a 14% rate of return on the property. All right, so again, we're doing a lease by lease analysis. So um, what we're doing is putting in the in information for each of our tenants. We have three tenants here. The uh, The idea was that the bank uh, signed their lease a couple of years ago. They were at $14 a square foot at, at that time. Um, so their base rent is, is 14. The law firm uh, was like a year ago. Uh, was the way we were thinking of it, and, and uh, so they're at 1450. This was a case where market rents were going up each year, and a broker recently signed a lease at $15 a square foot. And, and you see the amount of square feet that each of them have, and then uh, the expiration date. Uh, don't really need a start date; you could put it in there. But if we're putting in the uh, what the rent currently is and when it's going to expire, that's that's the important thing for for our investment analysis. Uh, over to the right, uh, there could be free rent. If there was, you'd put that in. Um, there could be some some current vacancy associated with that lease for some reason. Um, there could be, in, in, you know, especially if, if the lease isn't going to start for a while, uh, there could be some tenant improvements associated with that lease. If we've already signed the lease, you wouldn't think there'd be any any TIs. If there's a new, if it's a new lease, there could be TIs uh, that we're putting in there. Like since the broker in this example. Uh, the idea was they, they are uh, just recently signing their lease, so there may have been some TIs that, that we want to capture if, if our analysis is, is right before they signed their lease. And then if there's commissions, we'd put that in there. Um, you see that going, going back to where it has increased, um, that's a lie, allowing you to put in some more detail on, on how the rents may be increasing during the term of the lease. We're going to see in a minute how we handle what happens on the on the lease renewal. Uh, but if there's like step provisions in the lease, we could put that in uh, by drilling down in, into where those little dots, three dots are under the increase column. Uh, also, the more column at the far right uh, allows you to go into some additional information. Uh, like if you want to put in a credit rating for the tenant, a stock symbol, uh, whether there's a guarantor or their website and, and so forth. None of that is really going to impact the analysis, but it's some additional information that you want to uh, store in the program on that particular lease. Okay, so normally, of course, you'd, you might have more leases than, than this, but it's the same same idea. No matter how many leases there are, you know, what's what's the rent? They're square feet, and how's it going to increase over the term of the lease? And uh, 
and so forth. There may also be some, some additional income, as we talked about. In this case, um, we don't have any, but it could be, again, vending, laundry, telecommunications, parking. Um, we also need to think about whether there's going to be some, some vacancy that's going to kick in at some point in time. In, in this particular example, I didn't have any vacancy in years one to three because uh, the idea was we already have leases. None of them are going to expire until uh, we get to year four. So what I did is I have the vacancy starting off in year four. All the space was, was initially uh, fully occupied by the leases. So we didn't have any, any vacant space to lease up. Um, now, if, if we took this analysis to a lender, they'd probably say, eh, you know, I, I want to see some vacancy in years one, two, and three. I, you know, I hear you that, you know, that space is leased, but I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. There may be some reason that, you know, that you lose a tenant. So they may force you to go back and put in some, some vacancy in, in years one, two, and three. In any case, you know, the idea is you'd, you'd make some assumptions about what's going to happen to, to vacancy over time, especially as, as new leases, uh, as your leases are rolling over and you got to replace tenants with a new lease. Then, you know, when a lease does roll over, um, in this case, we're looking at, at the bank. You'd, you'd have to look at this for each of the tenants. Um, what kind of lease term is there going to be for the new lease? Um, in this case, we're saying a new lease is going to be for five years. Are there going to be any, any rent abatements at that time? Um, is there going to be some vacancy associated with, uh, with, you know, the time it's going to take to, to get a new tenant if, if this tenant doesn't renew? Um, are there any tenant improvements that we're going to have when, when this lease rolls over or leasing commissions? Then lo looking at the rent increases, you see that uh, in this case, we're looking at on a square foot per year basis. Um, how much is the rent going to jump up uh, at, at the time that this lease is going to renew? Uh, again, this might be a, a w looked at in terms of a weighted average of what uh, a new tenant would pay versus uh, uh, if the existing tenant renews. But somehow you're thinking, you know, what are market rents going to be at the time the, the lease renews? And in this case, we're looking at it as a $2.75 $2 increase uh, that we're going to have when, when that lease turns over. In other words, uh, it's going to be $2.75 higher than the base rent. On, on the property now. So that the idea is that that gets us up to market rents at the time that lease is going to renew. We could have steps uh, during the lease term. Um, in, in this case, we, we don't. Um, so all, all we're doing is taking into consideration uh, what the jump up is going to be when, when the lease rolls over. And then uh, this actually is, is applying to both the existing lease as well as uh, lease renewals, what kind of expense pass-throughs do we have? Um, so in this case, for the bank, uh, this was based on, on a, a, an expense stop of $4 per square foot. So the, it'd be like expenses were $4 a square foot at the time the bank signed their lease. And so the, the owner has said, okay, I'll, I'll pay the first $4 per square foot, but I want you to pay anything above Four dollars per square foot. That's an expense pass through, um, and so we're going to take the four dollars a square foot times seventy thousand square feet that the bank has, and so anything above two hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars is going to be passed through to that tenant. It's on a prorated basis based on you know the amount of space that that they have leased. Probably the best way to think of this is just anything above four dollars a square foot. You know where you're taking all the expenses on the building, at least those that are reimbursable. We'll get to that in a minute and dividing it by the total square feet. And, you know, if it's above four bucks, then, you know, uh, that extra amount applied to how many square feet that tenant has is what's going to be passed through. All right, then um, at the top we have, uh, well, this this whole, except for the very bottom, this deals with loan information. You could have some reserves. You're, you're going to uh, be able to borrow some money on to, to fund those uh, reserves, and so you could specify that uh, along with the interest rates you're going to pay. Um, but the main thing would would be that uh, on this particular property, we're going to borrow five million nine hundred fifty thousand dollars on a fixed rate loan, 
you know, so that leaves a down payment of two million five fifty. That's our equity investment in the property, which is going to be important for our calculations. Of course, all this is important for our calculations, but I want to emphasize that you know our rate of return is going to be based on that initial equity investment. Then we have a uh, 20-year amortization, uh, monthly payments, interest rate at 10%, and that gives us a monthly payment of $57,418 rounded. Um, and then the bottom is our tax information on the property. Um, it says new feature there because what was changed in the program to accommodate the better the, the uh, more recent tax law um, and so allow you to put in whatever federal income tax rate you want. It used to be you'd, you'd pick from a schedule of, of tax rates, but um, a lot of different possibilities today for what you could end up with as your federal income tax rate. Um, and then your long-term capital gains tax rate, 15%. Um, that would be the, the rate that you would pay on, on any increase in value. Remember, the depreciation recapture would, would still be taxed at, at 25%. Apply passive loss rules would, would be limiting your um, tax deductions to uh, any passive income that, that you have on the property. In this case, we're, we're going to assume that uh, we do have enough income to, uh, to offset any losses against. And you could input a state income tax rate if, if you uh, want to bring that into the analysis. Okay. Uh, let, let's look in, at the expenses on the property. So um, property management fee, in this case, is going to be 5% of your uh, base rent and your reimbursables. It could be based just on the base rent. Um, I think probably what's more typical is, is you're going to pay the property manager based on not just the base rent, but, but the reimbursement income that you're going to get. Um, but the... Um, Property management fee itself is is not reimbursable in the sense of charging the tenants for the property management fee, which I think is pretty typical, although there's a checkbox there that you could say that it is reimbursable. You could have some replacement uh, reserve allowance, uh, as I've talked about. I think it's better um, if you jump actually to the very bottom here, you see capital expenditures where you can put in an amount in a year, um, I think. Personally, that's a better way to do it is to specify exactly when you think you're going to have some money on to spend on CapEx. And that way, the program will start depreciating it if you're doing an after-tax analysis uh, in the year that you're actually spending the money. And then you see all the other expenses that we have, uh, the property tax, insurance, utilities, janitorial, maintenance, handyman. If you had one, uh, we, we just had down through maintenance in this example. So... You put in the expenses as they currently are, the expected increases, and you notice the checkbox for whether they're reimbursable or not. In other words, are they expenses you can include in, in that uh, expense pass-through calculation that we talked about earlier, the, the $4 a square foot that we had for the bank? Um, so you can, only, you can only include the expenses that are reimbursable in, in seeing if it's above the $4 a square foot. All right, so those those were all our inputs. Um, there there could be more and a little bit more complex analysis, but that, that covers the the basic inputs. Um, it should have paralleled uh, the ingredients that that we we talked about um, for any kind of a, a, a an investment analysis where you want to capture uh, the individual leases. You know, so so now we're to our projections. There's, there's a number of different reports that are available. Um, in this case, we're, we're looking at a cash flow analysis report. Um, so your, your scheduled uh, gross income based on, on the base rents, um, less any, any vacancy on the property. Again, remember the vacancy kicked in in years four and five in this case. Then we subtract our operating expenses. Um, We've got net operating income, 901, 375 the first year, et cetera. This only shows uh, five years because um, we're going we're gonna to do an analysis over five years. But although it's not shown here, the program would still calculate the income in year six because that's going to be what's used to calculate our, our resale price for the reasons I talked about before. 
If we subtract our loan payment from our net operating income, we have our cash flow on the property. Um, and then you see cash on cash return before tax. That's just taking that net cash flow and dividing it by the initial equity investment. Um, I've seen uh, the cash on cash return calculated by taking the cash flow each year and dividing by what your equity would be that year if you sold the property that year. In other words, taking into consideration that the value of the property may have gone up and you've also uh, paid down the debt. That would be another way to do it. Um, I think it's more common though to, to divide by your initial equity every year. So in this case, we're, uh, we're always dividing by the same uh, initial equity investment. To do an after-tax analysis, we need to calculate our taxable income. So we subtract our depreciation. Um, for, this is just tax depreciation. Of course, it has nothing to do with how the property is actually wearing out. It's whatever the IRS allows. Uh, we can also subtract any interest. That's all tax deductible. Um, so that gives us our taxable income of 133,288. Um, I think an important point here is you'll notice Taxable income is about 133,000. Our before tax cash flow is 212,000. So uh, that's the tax benefits that we have associated with this, um, that we're paying tax on, on a lower um, amount of income than our actual cash flow on the property. Again, because of the uh, depreciation and the, the interest deductions working for us. So we do have positive taxable income, so we, we don't have to worry about having other income to offset any losses against. Uh, so we have taxes of 46, 651 the first year, et cetera. Um, so subtracting our taxes from our before tax cash flow gives us our after tax cash flow, 165, 699 the first year. And we can also look at a cash on cash return uh, on an after tax basis. Again, dividing by that initial equity investment, so 6.5% the first year, et cetera. So we, we do have a, a pretty pretty healthy amount of cash on cash return in this particular example. This is a, a little bit more detailed look at the operating data each year, mainly breaking out the expenses in more detail. Uh, and, and showing how that scheduled gross income consists of both the uh, the base rental income plus any expense reimbursements. So let me repeat that at the top. You see that we've got our base rental income, but we also have our expense reimbursements. Uh, and you notice that uh, that's increasing for three years. And then if we were in the classroom and I could ask you questions, I would say, why did it drop in year four? And you would say, oh, because we got leases that are rolling over. Uh, in, in year four. And so um, we're, we're going to collect some reimbursements when when we get a new lease, but it's going to start at a higher expense stop. It's not going to be $4 a square foot anymore. It's going to be whatever the expenses are. Uh, at least what would be typical would be it's based on whatever expenses are uh, at the time that lease renews. So that's why you see it drop down to 13. Then it starts to work its way back up again, goes to 21,000. Uh, rounded in expense reimbursements in year five. All right, so aside from that, I think we've talked about the uh, things on here. We've got our expense projections each year, same uh, net operating income as we saw before at the bottom. So just a, a different kind of report that we can look at on the property. Then our, our resale analysis. So the idea here is, um, what would we get if we sold the property in year one? Well, if we didn't sell it in year one, what would we get if we sold the property in year two and so on out through year five? Personally, uh, I don't really like this. I'd rather just say, what you know, what do we get if our holding period is five years and that's when we really think we're going to sell it or 10 years or whatever. You know, tell me the, uh, the cash flow that I would get if I sell it in, in that year. The reason I say that is I don't think it would be the same terminal cap rate that you would use uh, in year one as you would use in year two and year three and year four and year five. <laughs> Remember we talked about how, you know, adding a risk premium, interest rates could have gone up, the property is getting older. Um, but every program does this. Um, so we're, you know, we're doing the same thing that other programs do. We're saying, well, let's take whatever the terminal cap rate is we put in and, 
and then apply that to get a resale price in, in each year uh, as if we sold it in that year. So I would rather focus in on, on what we're going to get in year five when, when we really think we're going to sell the property or year 10 or, or whatever you've picked as your holding period. Okay, some return analysis. So this is what you know we we're really hoping to uh, to get as a bottom line, right? Is uh, uh, what what's our rate of return going to be on the property? Let's just jump down to internal rate of return (IRR) because that's really the the uh, the bottom line on this. Um, the uh, the other numbers are pretty much what we've already talked about. Um, although notice that year one uh, does have your invested capital there. Um, in fact, the invested capital is the same no matter what year you're looking at because that was what you originally invested. So that $2,550,000 is, again, your, your equity. Um, the IRR in, in this case, um, if we go out to year five, the, the IRR each year is if you sold it in that year. But let's focus on year five. So on an after-tax basis, we would get 13.38% as our after-tax IRR on the property. Um, if we wanted this to be a before tax IRR, we could just go back and put in zero for our tax rates. The program doesn't separately calculate a before tax IRR. Um, we could add that, but um, all you would need to do is, is zero out your tax rate. Similarly, if, if you wanted the rate of return without a loan on an unleveraged basis, you could just zero out your loan information. That can easily be done with a sensitivity analysis. Uh, just like you might use a sensitivity analysis to change some of the other assumptions, like you know what you're going to get on a lease renewal, et cetera. Um, modified IRR is something that assumes reinvestment. That's kind of controversial and a lot of different ways to do it. Um, probably just forget about that one for, for now. NPV is is uh, is useful though because that's um, what. It's sort of like how much more you could have paid for the property. Um, that's looking at it based on uh, discounting things uh, on an equity basis, how much cash flow that you're getting after your, your mortgage payments, your, your debt service. So discounting that back and uh, seeing how much you're, you're getting above your, your $2,550,000 down payment. Um, the final row there, which is labeled PV of NOI plus reversion, um, it's sort of buried in this program that you see the 8,011,186 in year five. But um, if this was a program that was emphasizing appraisal, that would be on the very first page. Your appraised value, your market value is $8,011,186 because that's how much you would pay to get a 14% IRR on the property. Um, based on taking the present value of your uh, your NOI and, and your resale price. In other words, ignoring taxes and financing uh, and using the discount rate that was put in uh, as a typical rate of return that an investor would want on a before-tax basis, which is the way you, appraisers usually look at it, um, what would be the market value of the property? If, if our assumptions and our discount rate were more um, what we think we would get and especially what we think we would want, as a rate of return, then you could label it more of an investment value. But the point is the, the program can, can definitely give you a value for the property. Even though that's under year five, <coughs> that would be what we would pay today for the property, assuming we're going to sell it in year five. Okay, so our, our valuation would be 8 million, you know, 11,000 rounded uh, as, as a value for the property. We have a little bit different answer uh, as if we sold it in year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five, because I think mainly it's different because we're assuming the same terminal cap rate, which probably wouldn't be appropriate. It's probably more likely that, you know, that uh, value would, would be the same no matter how, how many years we assume we're going to hold it. <coughs> Some other financial Indicators, um, the uh, gross rent multiplier you're probably all familiar with, capitalization rate is our cap rate. Again, our cash on cash returns. What's new in this report is the debt coverage ratio, or sometimes called debt service coverage ratio, 
which is our net operating income to debt service. That's of course of particular interest to the lenders. A, a kind of a rough rule of thumb is that the debt service coverage ratio should be above 1.2, although that really varies by, by property type. You know, hotel would be higher, for example. Um, but, you know, that's, that's your margin of safety for the lender that your net operating income is sufficient to cover your, your debt service on the property. A lot of times lenders care more about that than the loan to value ratio. Um, yeah, the other, other, I think items on, on uh, this report are pretty straightforward. Your net income multiplier, you know, which is just your, um, price divided by your net income, just like the gross rent multiplier is your price divided by gross rent. And then your loan to value ratio on the property. It's, it's usually the loan to value ratio combined with your debt service coverage ratio that, uh, determines how much you're able to borrow on the property. You, you can look at more in more detail with what's going on with each individual tenant. Um, so in this case, the bank, you can see what their base income is each year, their expense reimbursements that they're paying each year to result in the total potential revenue just for the bank. And you could look at this for each of the individual tenants. Also get some nice graphs. I've just picked out a couple of those, but this is showing your, your initial equity, which of course stays the same. Um, but then uh, you, let's call it equity buildup. That's a term that's often used. Your equity buildup due to loan reduction, the blue, and due to property appreciation, the green. Um, this, this is a nice picture of, you know, why we invest in, in real estate, right? Especially if we think, you know, that the tenants are going to pay our loan off for us and the property is going to go up in value over time. Um, so this is showing how our equity is building up over the, uh, the, in this case, out through through year 20. This is our cash flow each year before tax and after tax. So we can see how our cash flow is increasing. And then a breakdown of our operating expenses in, into different categories. Bunch of other graphs. I uh, just want to show you an example of, of some of the graphs you could look at. You can also share your files with other people. Uh, you can either email it just to one person or share it with everybody. Or in this case, I've shared this particular example that we've gone through. If you want to um, take uh, market edge and look at the exact example that we went through pretty quickly here today and go back and look at it again, um, you can do that by just going to the, the real estate exchange. It's in the, uh, on the left-hand side, you see uh, the services menu, and then you pick the real estate exchange and then uh, go to the academic community. I put put it in there so that students could get this example. And then just uh, in the drop down, you would see Monument Office. Pick that, and you'll have all the inputs for the example that we just went through. And then uh, lots of uh, ways you can create reports um, and what you want to include in those reports. Jeff, are you still there? I am just on mute. I thought maybe I would uh, ask you to jump in um, while I take a sip of water and, and tell us about the different ways you've seen our users uh, use the different reports that you can generate. After you've gone through all this brain damage that I talked about of putting in all these inputs and creating these projections, what do we do with it? Well, yeah, that's uh, there's a lot you can do with Market Edge. Market Edge can, it can create just a simple flyer, which is like the one pager that you're looking at now, which would have a a price and some some bullets to it to have the full blown offering memorandum and any point in between. So uh, we can automate the process to to capture the maps, the aerials, the uh, demographics around the property. So simply plug in an address and all of that is down at the bottom. There's available reports. You can just drag and drop and build up those reports, as well as all of those financial charts and spreadsheets that, that Jeff outlined. All of those are accessible to put into a uh, a presentation of the, the property. It also allows you to bring your comps in. Uh, if you have a comp library to do a market analysis and to support any of the estimates that you had as far as rental rates or cap rates, uh, that data can be supported by your, your comps. And then you're, you're able to put in and, and create customized uh, detail sheets or profile pages of the property with additional photos and either bulleted 
text about it, uh, text uh, paragraphs and uh, executive summaries and so forth with uh, additional data about the, the key attributes of the property. So it basically allows you to do not only the financial analysis, but to put to put your book together from a, um, what is a, a flyer, a teaser flyer to a, a full blown offering memorandum. And then we host also all of the data required in a due diligence vault, a private and secure deal room to download actual copies of leases or a title or um, environmental or other types of reports that might be needed to do a full analysis of the property and for an investor to make a decision. These can be privately branded, as you see. This one was branded for NAI Long Island. We, we can uh, brand it to not just have the different logo of a company, but to have different color schemes and uh, profile pages. And uh, you, you can do the, some of this stuff on your own, just your, your logo and colors will drop in. But if you want it to be highly customized with format and structure, we can do that for you. Jeff, there were a few other questions along the way. Okay. Yeah, we got you about turn it over to me. Yeah. Yep. Uh, there was a question on percentage rent. And I know you've got some thoughts on percentage rent, but I'll let you. I didn't want to just answer directly since we want to give the yeah, benefit. Yeah, unfortunately, the program doesn't allow you to directly calculate percentage rent. Uh, we don't have an input for the revenue um, for tenants in a shopping center. The, the idea would be a, per, a percentage rents, of course, is that you're getting a percentage of the sales income of the tenant. Uh, oftentimes, it kicks in ab above a certain uh, level of, of sales. So you have a minimum, a minimum rent, and then it, it, uh, it, the uh, percentage rent kicks in. You, so what you'd have to do is, is do that calculation uh, on the side, um, and then put in the result into, uh, in, into uh, market edge. So that, that's on our roadmap uh, to yeah, add, well, add to it the seems program. Like it's the same answer that you, you're really just putting in that percentage rent as a, a rent field. So you need to estimate what that percentage rent's going to be over time, as Jeff outlined, and then and plug that in as one of your, your line item entries and, and, and do that on the, uh, right. the, count, the, you know, the scheduled yeah, calendar. Right. You, you you uh, yeah, you just have to do a simple side calculation. Jeff, the, you were showing um, free rent and some other things on an annual basis, but I, you can actually drill down into those into the spreadsheets once those sort of high level inputs are, are built to put in specific uh, months during the, the year. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I sure. think that we showed you a sort of a macro right. level, didn't drill down into the actual month by month cash flow. So it was a question right. about what happens when, uh, you know, rent abatements in a mid year or expense changes mid year, anything, you know, things can be right. put uh, in a, in a, on a monthly schedule. Exactly. Yeah. To be clear, I, this was like a textbook example where, you know, you want to keep it relatively simple, but and capture the key concepts uh, without getting too bogged down in the detail. Uh, sort of fundamental finance question, Jeff, you, you, you use some terminology and uh, some questions, just uh, the NPVs, a uh, net present value. Just want to talk about that for, for a second. While I yeah, the, the net present value is the present value of any cash inflows. So you're discounting it at whatever discount rate you put in the program. So you take the present value of your cash inflows, including the cash flow from sale of the property, and then you subtract your initial investment. And, and that gives you your net present value. So it's called a net present value because it's uh, your cash inflows are netted by your initial investment. And you can think of it as how much more you're willing to pay for the, the property. If, if the uh, NPV is zero, then that means your rate of return, your IOR, is exactly equal to whatever, whatever discount rate you put in. Um, but if if the NPV is positive, that means you could have paid more. So you're coming out ahead by whatever the NPV is. Perfect. And, and right on cue, one of the, the final questions was, and Jeff, yeah, great job, as always, covering a lot of information in a short period of time. There's a question about the CCIM program. So, uh, yeah, in case you don't know, and I know many of you on the call today are CCIM members, as part of your membership uh, as a designee, you receive this Market Edge package. So you receive all of the financial analysis, all of the presentation tools to, to put your 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 uh, flyer, brochure, BOV, offering memorandum, proposal together, as well as the deal rooms. And that's that part of the Real Next Week is um, free to you as a CCIM member. You also have a substantial discount to upgrade to the the full real next suite, and uh, that's that's a benefit to designees. 
uh, affiliates or candidates for CCIM also get a benefit. They would just uh, receive a 20% discount off of the, the normal subscription price. So great value for all CCIMs and uh, uh, we appreciate the relationship with the organization. So let me see if there's anything else before we wrap up. I know that was a that was fast and a lot of material, but hopefully it, it gave everybody an idea of what you can do um, with with the program and you know how how it captures all the the key inputs that you would have in this type of a lease by lease analysis. And um, we could probably have some follow up more advanced webinars uh, if there's a desire for it. That's great. And there was was one more question about the BOV. You'll see in this uh, uh, page that's up the included reports and the available reports. The included reports are what would come into what, what you have as output to deliver to a client, whether it's a proposal or a brochure, flyer, offering memorandum. So those, this is just three pages. There's, there's, as you see, each of those available reports on the bottom. There's eight custom reports, five aerial reports. So, you know, 30 or so different reports that can be included, as well as additional PDFs that you can add to the section. Those, once you create that package. And this is a three-page pack. This could be your your summary teaser, you call it. That becomes a template, which then can be reapplied time after time. So as you put the initial inputs in, you, you ask for your your teaser report, and boom, it's done. All of that's prepackaged and ready to go. You might say, "Give me the full-blown office and uh, office uh, offering memorandum," and that has 30 sections to it, and that automatically pulls all of that information together to for you to present. So really fast and, and easy to swap between. A, a teaser and a full detail. And one of the questions was, what about a market analysis for a, a BPO or, or BOV to broker price opinion or opinion to value? That's one of our standard forms as well. Another uh, template that you create how, how you like, um, it creates summary data about the comps, about the discounted cash flow analysis and the different models to get to your your price opinion as well as your your overview of the property. So it really streamlines the process based on basic data inputs and the information that you have in the system. So you don't need to redundantly enter that. And again, if you have a comp a comps library, which I would think you'd all have in your, your database that would automatically allow you to pick which comps you want to use in your summary to make sure that your property is seen within a framework of like properties and make adjustments to those on a per square foot or cap rate basis to, to get your um, key metrics that you're, you're basing your pricing on. So we give you all of that uh, again, Free for CCIM, low cost for uh, uh, new new customers. If you already have our CRM or marketplace, you can upgrade and, and get and this as part of your full suite solution. It, there was, a, uh, there, as always, questions about the uh, this recording being distributed. It will be uh, probably early next week. We'll get a, a post out about it with both the deck and the video recording. And um, other questions as I go through and can't get to them because we're running long now. We'll, we'll you know get to you uh, directly. So thank you all once again, Jeff, any, any closing remarks, anything that uh, we missed, but uh, no, just uh, thank, like everybody, thank everybody for coming and hope, hope you found it useful. I guess that's my last slide actually. Uh, sure. Thanks for watching uh, and, and hope you like it. Thanks Jeff. Thanks everybody.